right, tonight we're taking a look at John, and we have 8 through 10, and oh my, that, those three chapters are filled with so many lessons, and uh, for us to touch on everything in there, we would probably shortchange them all. So, I'd like to captivate a couple of key points that the Lord has laid upon my heart, and to introduce it. Uh, we're going to be seeing the chapter 9 on the DVD that we watched a little bit this morning. But before we do uh, begin that DVD, let's uh, pray, pray, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. And Lord, before we pray that the Holy Spirit anoint the Word tonight, my heart is heavy um, regarding several members of our congregation and also friends of our congregation that really need a touch in their bodies. Frederico has been in my heart. Frederico is one of our family here. He goes for dialysis several times a week. So that machine that keeps him going. We pray for healing in the name of Jesus. We pray for education. Bill as he battles cirrhosis in the name of Jesus. We pray for Pastor Pete as he battles cancer in the name of Jesus. And we pray for Carolyn Lambert. We just pray, oh God, that you would just touch her. She lies in the hospital, the same ugly condition that our brother Rocky uh, was healed of. And we just pray, Lord, that your healing virtue would go to, to Carolyn, that she would be saved from having her colon removed. God, just heal that colon, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And now, oh God, we just ask your word to speak to us, myself included, Holy Spirit, do your work in our hearts, O oh God. Open our eyes to truth, that we might walk in the truth, see in the truth, and do the truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's watch chapter 9. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind. Teacher, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his own? Or his parents' sin? His blindness has nothing to do with his sins or his parents' sins. He is blind so that God's power might be seen at work in him. As long as it is they, you must keep on doing the work of him who sent me. Nice is coming. But no one can work. <laughs> well, I am the world. I am the light for the world. Hey. After he said this, Jesus spat on the ground and made some mud with the spittle. He rubbed the mud on the man's eyes. Don't wash your face in the pool of Saddam. This name means sent.
she says, I came back singing. His neighbors then, and the people who had seen him begging before this, asked, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? He's the one. No, he isn't. He just looks like him. I am the man. How is it that you can now see? The man called Jesus made some mud, rubbed it on my eyes, and told me to go to Shalom and wash my face. So I went. And as soon as I washed, I could see. Where is he? I don't know. <laughs> when they took to the Pharisees, the man who had been blind, the day that Jesus made the mud and cured him of his blindness was the Sabbath. The Pharisees then asked the man again how he had received his sight. He put some mud on my eyes. I washed my face. And now I can see. The man who did this cannot be from God. He does not obey the Sabbath law. How could a man who is a sinner perform such miracles as these? And there was division among them. You say he cured you of your blindness. Well, what do you say about him? He is a prophet. The Jewish authorities, however, were not willing to believe that he had been blind and could now see until they called his parents. Is this your son? You say that he was born blind. How is it then that he can now see? We know that he is our son, and we know that he was born blind. But we don't know how it is that he is now able to see, nor do we know who cured him of his blindness. Ask him. He is old enough and he can answer for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities who had already agreed that anyone who said he believed that Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That is why his parents said, he is old enough, ask him. A second time, they called back the man who had been born blind. Promise before God that you will tell the truth. We know that this man who cured you is a sinner. I do not know if he's a sinner or not. One thing I do know. I was blind. And now I see. How did he cure you of your blindness? I have already told you and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Maybe you too would like to be his disciples. That's how it But we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spoke to Moses. As for that fellow, however, we do not even know where he comes from. What a strange thing that is. You do not know where he comes from, but he cured me of my blindness. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He does listen to people who respect him and do what he wants them to do. Since the beginning of the world, nobody has ever heard of anyone giving sight to a person born blind. Unless this man came from God, he would not be able to do a thing! You were born and brought up in shame! You are trying to teach us. And they expelled him from the synagogue. so that I can believe in him. You have already seen him. He's the one who is talking with you now. I believe, Lord. And he knelt down before Jesus. I came to this world to judge, so that the blind should see, and those who see should become blind. Some Pharisees who were there with him heard him say this and asked him, Surely you don't mean that we are blind to.
If you were blind, then you would not be guilty. But since you claim that you can see, this means that you are still guilty. Cut. Michael, that's exactly what you're going to do. Amen. <laughs> 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 that way, guys, your appetite wets. You show sure it, you'll be all excited. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Who in the heck was blind in that story? <laughs> <laughs> Certainly wasn't the man, was it? No, no. Yeah. The reasoning. You know, the beginning, of course, the, fair, the uh, disciples want to know what the cause, but the Lord wanted to tell the purpose of his blindness. It was truly that God would be glorified. And he would do the work that he was called to do as being the light of the world. Just a couple little comments. I'm not going to reiterate all that was said there. But um, did you notice in the beginning, if you listen after I was listening to it several times, at first the man says, well, it's the man. He just did this, and that was it. I don't know where he is. And then when he was standing before the council, and by the way, when there's a killing, they had to go before the council to verify it. And uh, then he, they asked, well, who do you think? He, well, he had to be a prophet, because he knew Elijah and Elisha, they performed miracles. And so that's why he responded by saying, well, he must be a prophet. So he went from a man to a prophet. And at the end of the story, he embraces the son of man. Isn't that wonderful? But the reason why I think the Pharisees uh, said call his parents is I really do think that they slipped in another beggar or something. That they, this was really the guy that was blind, you know, from birth. This was a, a, a false person that they slipped in there just to try to pull the wool over their eyes. But they had a certain framework that they knew you had to follow. And one thing was you didn't work on the Sabbath, and healing somebody in the Sabbath was a sin. Therefore, Christ had to be a sinner. He couldn't have healed. I mean, they're blind because of their own understanding of what God is all about. Amen? Amen. Well, the one thing that they mentioned here were in chapter 9, where he talks about opening their eyes, and then at the end, it's kind of an enigma, when he talks about to the Pharisees about being blind. And I think that this whole story really does have a spiritual connotation. And I think when we all clapped and said, once I was blind, but now I see, we often think about that when we make our own conversion, don't we? I don't care what you say. I was blind, I was, now I can see. I was lost and now I'm found. I was dead and now I'm alive. But I think, let's go back over to chapter 8. And let's pick it up at, ch at verse 12, please. Chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus had made reference in chapter 9 as being the light of the world. So let's take a look at where he initially talks about that. In chapter 8, verse 12, it says, Again, Jesus spoke to them. These are to the, to the crowd, to the Pharisees, whoever's around. He's saying this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Notice that it's like follow and then you get. You follow and then you receive. You will have the light of life. That word follow doesn't mean trailing somebody several blocks away where they can't see you. That follow means very closely. I think the best analogy would be like a shadow. When you move, they move. It's a very close following that he's talking about there. And he says, if you follow me, then what does he say? I will give you what? The light of life. If you want to put your finger there, let's turn to John 1, chapter 1, where Jesus has used this before. John chapter 1. I didn't mark my Bible so that I'd take time to find it. And that way maybe you will find it in time too. 1, 4. Of course it begins with the uh, declaration that the Word was with God, the Word was God, and all things were made through Him. And then He's identified in verse 4. In Him, in the Logos, in the Word, in Christ was life, 
And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The life of Jesus Christ imparted in us opens our eyes to the light. Yes. The light. Yes. Dead people cannot see. They have to be alive to be able to see. Yes. Remember Nicodemus? Flip over now as we progress back to our text. Look in chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 3. Nicodemus, of course, was a Pharisee, but, you know, he didn't want the other Pharisees to know that he was interested in Jesus, so he comes by night, kind of incognito, and he starts talking to him, and he's, he says, you know, you must be somebody special with all that you're doing. And Jesus says what? Truly, truly, I say, verse 3, unless one is born again, he cannot, what? See the kingdom of God. And so... You have to be born again to see. Dead people don't see. So don't be surprised when you have dead people out there in their sin and transgression and they don't get it. Don't be surprised what the heathen will do. They're going to be like the Pharisees. They're going to come up with all kinds of, of responses. As I was driving here, I was thinking about the scientists that say, well, it just exploded into existence. In reference to the, the way the world was created. Well, it just, what's it? Well, nothing, just exploded. Well, that's about as dumb as the Pharisee's response to the blind man. How in the heck can nothing do anything? Nothing can't do anything. So if there was something that came from nothing, that doesn't make sense. Nothing from nothing is... Oh, that's a little song. But anyway. <laughs> it's a no-brainer. Oh, but no, but no, but we can't have a creator. No, it's got to be it's just kind of, oh, no, we don't, can't have a creator. It's just like the Pharisees. Their premise is there cannot be a God, there cannot be a creator, therefore, poof, it just happened. <laughs> And that's about as silly as the response of these Pharisees to this blind man who was obviously had his eyes open and he see. And his parents, of course, they're afraid to get kicked out of the synagogue if they acknowledge, you know, Jesus. And that was something more than just going down the street to somewhere else. That meant you were, you know, your family, your relationship. I mean, the synagogue was your central hub. But there he was, and the man's very frustrated. What do you mean? I don't know what you're talking about, but I was blind, and now I can see. And this is just infuriating it. And that's when you start talking about these people, and, and right away, well, that's just religion. We're not here about religion. This, uh, we're scientists. And it just went, poof. I thought, well, that's the worst scientific method I've ever heard. It doesn't make sense. And that's precisely why a lot of people of intelligence in the scientific world are at least acknowledging that there is a designer and there was someone who did the poof <laughs> spoke it into existence according to what we know. But that's about as bad. But don't be surprised because they're in darkness and they're going to respond like people in darkness. Sometimes we get so reactive with people when they do things to us. And they're not Christians, they're in darkness. And we get so defensive and reactive and we're just down on their level. But let's not get, get too reactive because we know that they're in darkness. Well, then he goes, let's go back to our text in chapter 8. And it says, he said, I am the light of the world. Well, when we say, and he mentions that also in chapter 9 when we heard it on the screen. The light of the world. That, that means that the world is in darkness. And it's the light. Notice it's the light, not a light. It's the light. It's the light for the world. 
of the world, in the world. And we know that the light we're talking about is Jesus Christ. So we know that Jesus Christ is the only light for the world. It's the only light that the world needs. And you know what is fascinating is the fact is that this world was made by that light. So you realize that the light is not foreign from this world. He created it. What's foreign in the world is the sin and the violence and everything that goes with fallen man. And so when the light comes in the world, it's like he's illuminating this world to see, for us to see, how it truly, really is. It's his world. And those of you who are illuminated by the light, all of a sudden, you see things in a different manner. If your eyes have been opened to the light of the world, all of a sudden, you see creation for what it is. You see the mighty handiwork of God. You see people in a different way. And you know, it was even Paul who said, uh, let's see, I'm going to just turn it to you. Um, look in 2 Corinthians. Excuse me. 2 Corinthians. Uh, 4. There's a couple of places. Let's try this one. 2 Corinthians 4. Four. Actually, you go up to three. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In this, verse four, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gloss gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaimed is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ is Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Verse 6, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's how the light of the world comes into us and we have that light of man so that we can see things differently. Um, the one thing that I was thinking of is where do we have, how about going back to 2 Corinthians 5. Everybody knows 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. But take a look at 16. Paul says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. I'm going to say it again. From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ. What is that saying? Brothers and sisters, people who are born again into the family of God, children of light, we have got to start seeing them as people of the light. We see them no longer in the flesh. You know, we're so quick to pass judgment on others and hope others will see the graciousness that we have. <laughs> And we are quick to judge others in the body of Christ. He says, see no one in the flesh anymore. See them as fellow members that have that light of life inside of them. And I'll go a step further. We need to start seeing the lost in different ways. We need to see them not as a, well, what do you think? What is he trying to do? Blah, 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 blah. Actually, what we're seeing is people who are lost that need the light. They're the ones that we need to shine. 
And as we preach the gospel, as we share the truth, it's the Holy Spirit's job to say, let there be light and open their understanding to embrace the truth so that they too can become. Once I was blind, but now I see. So the light of the world means a whole lot. And it's something we need to think about. It's changing our understanding. Now, it's not just a one-time affair where we say, let there be light, the light came into me, therefore. Listen, my friends. We have hearts that become callous. The Lord continues to try to shine His light into our hearts. And oh, I pray that we allow the calluses to come off the eyes of our hearts so that we can allow that spiritual illumination to continue to come in. So that we can be quick to say, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, forgive me. So that we can then press on in newness of life. Because as we do that, then we're going to find ourselves more transparent because Jesus said, I am the light of the world, but when I go, what? You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Now, if you walk in darkness, you're not the light. And you know what is really something, my friends? What did Jesus use to describe hell? He said, what? They will be put into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Dead men cannot see. Just like Jesus is going to address the people later on in this chapter, you are going to die in your sins. You die in darkness unless the God of this world who has blinded you the Spirit of the Holy God comes in and illuminates you and you are born again so that you can see the kingdom of God. And all of a sudden you're operating on that level like that blind man did. See, when we come to the end, actually there's like a fork in the road. And there's one this way and one that way. And let me show you what I'm talking about because Jesus had some words to say to these Pharisees at the end of chapter 9. Hang in there. End of chapter 9. Oh, I'm looking at 2 Corinthians. 